You know, I've shared with you, I asked you last week, I, um, I said the Lord's been working in my life and, and really leading us into a new direction. And, and uh, I'd shared with you last week, um, actually this today, I'm starting my, my fourth week of fasting. And I asked you guys to, if you would, fast in some level last week to make a commitment. Um, we are at the point of breakthrough in this church. And, and you can't go to where you're heading with what you had before. Um, the Lord's looking to lighten some loads and, and press down some convictions. So this week, I, I, um, I knew that the Lord had told me a couple weeks ago that we were going we to pump the brakes on the Gospel of Mark message and that He's got a word for us. And, uh, and this is the first week of that word. I originally thought it was going to be a four-week uh, message, but honestly, it's going to be what the Lord says it's going to be. It could be a week. It could be two. Uh, when the cloud moves, we're going to move, and, and when it sets, we're going to set. So... I want to get started with this message. There's a, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of scripture. <laughs> there's a lot of scripture. I really felt like I was back in my days helping the uh, district attorney prosecute a case with a lot of evidence. So um, I don't think it's ever a bad thing that there's a lot of scripture. Amen. So the message that I have for you today is from lies to liberation, unlocking God's blessings. And like I said, I had no plans to pause the Gospel of Mark series. Two weeks ago, the Lord gave me scripture and an urgent message that I will not ignore. And it's from Romans 8, 26. And he says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with the groanings which cannot be uttered. So why the inter intercession urgency? The Lord is groaning to use this church as an example of light in an ever darkening world. God's calling us into deeper relationship. But to get there, we must follow His commands. The message isn't just about what the church needs. It's about your personal relationship with God. You see, every time God gives instructions to His church, there's a balance of encouragement and correction. So which news do you want to hear first? Well, here's the encouragement. God is pleased that we're a house of prayer and worship. He loves that we are bold to love and move freely in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But here's the correction. That we are not obedient to His command to tithe. Amen. You see, this message is not about money. It's about your relationship with God. It. It's trusting Him in all the areas of your life. The one thing that the Lord put on my heart is the tithe is God's trust test for relationships. Man. You see, you either trust God to provide you for everything by bringing Him your tithe, or you trust worldly wealth and materialism as your God. You go. So if we will stand together as the anchor scripture, I told you last week we were going to stop at the widow's offering. And we would pick up here today. So let's read this as the body. It's from Mark 12, 41, 44, the widow's offering. Let's read together as the body. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has given more than all the others who were making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So why this message now? Well, I will tell you that as I taught the six-week equipping class of healthy stewardship, the Lord kept revealing that many in the body of Christ... Many in the body of Christ have either rejected his command to tithe or haven't properly been taught about tithing or have allowed the enemy to twist God's command about tithing. You see, many believers admit to being confused about God, what God expects. So they either, they either give or do based on their feelings or they just don't tithe at all. I get it. I get it. I understand, but there should be no confusion when it comes to God's Word. Amen. Today I want to address whatever your reason may be 
for not tithing. Ultimately, the choice is yours. But choose wisely. So the solution to this confusion is I'm going to only share God's Word. And I'm going to trust that it will bring this church into alignment. So God can move into that posture of groaning to use this church as a bright light in a darkening world. This church was called to this city to break hard ground. I will submit that this is a well-churched region. But the Holy Spirit has not permeated. So what is the challenge? The challenge is untangling Satan's deception. You see what he's done? He's twisted Scripture to create a false love for materialism and to resist honoring God through the tithe. What I will ask is who made you believe that tithing was optional? I will tell you that it was Satan. He blocks your blessings. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 tells us, Satan, who is the God, and I will say lowercase g, Satan is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeliness of God. See, instead of being angry at Satan, the deceiver who's come to kill, steal, and destroy, many blame the church. But I will tell you that my assignment today is to help you unlock God's abundant blessings. Trusting God's Word corrects this demonic case of misinformation. So what is listening to Satan costing you? You see, when your heart clings to anything but God, you repeat Adam and Eve's mistakes. You hand over to Satan all the authority and all the dominion God first intended for you. Genesis 3.23 tells you, So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and He sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. You see, God gave them everything, but because they listened to the small manipulation of Satan. Did God really say that? Because they fell for a twisted doctrine of a demon. Instead of having authority, and dominion over everything, Adam was sent out to cultivate the ground. When we step outside the Word of God, we find ourselves in dry, arid places, trying to get something meant for nothing instead of receiving everything that was once given to you. So how does Satan do it? Well, the same way that he used a piece of fruit to separate Adam and Eve from God. He uses money to do the same with you. I will tell you the truth about tithing is we treat God's tithe like an option to tip the waitress at Sonic. Come on. Come on. I will tell you that tithing is not optional. That's right. Now I know, and I get it all the time. Oh, that's the law. That's the law. We're not under the law. What I will tell you is tithing was established about 500 years before Mosaic Law. And it continues today as it was affirmed in New Testament Scriptures. As I'll show you, don't let Satan rob you of God's blessings. Obey and trust God by tithing. So, like we did in criminal cases, we want to go against the bad guy with facts. Satan's false allegations against the tithes. You see what he's done is he's twisted the truth about tithing. He's seduced many Christians into loving their money over God. He's got one trick. He's got one trick. And it's manipulating God's word so that we feel that we can love both Christ and cash. But Jesus himself made this clear. In Matthew 6, 24, he tells you, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The word mammon isn't purposely used because it's a spirit of greed. 
a spirit of pursuing material wealth. You see, greed opposes generosity. And I will share this as an equipping moment. I want to be real and I want to be practical. The best way to understand this message is by looking at your own life. You see, the purpose of the tithe is to reveal who you truly serve. What I want you to do, and I want you to remember this is a message of encouragement and correction. But I want later today, if you would look at your bank account. And if, and if for example, Five Stones, let me give you something tangible. Five Stones Church is, your, is where you're fed spiritually. Is your storehouse. Does it show up in your bank account? You see, your spending shows what's important to you. Matthew 6.21 tells you, For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Like there's nothing wrong with enjoying Starbucks or video games or Cowboys tickets, but not at the expense of God's tithe. You see, we all tithe to something. The question is, which God are you tithing to? God asks for his tenth. Satan demands it all. In these perilous times, God's calling you to make a choice. I ask you to make the choice today to put God first. So I want to to offer a heart check. And I'm going to tell you, this, this comes from personal experience. Lee and I had to be delivered. We were delivered from this. We used to rail against the, the tithe. So when I mentioned the word tithe, no raise of hands, but did it make you feel uneasy? Was there a natural inclination to maybe roll your eyes? Well, I will tell you that money has no emotion. It doesn't love you. It won't even say goodbye to you as it's walking away from your wallet. So why do you hold on so tightly to money? Fear. Is your fear about not having enough enough money? Or is your fear that you don't trust God enough to provide? You see, this fear keeps you in a poverty mindset. It hinders your relationship with God. And I want to be clear that money's not the problem. The love of money is the problem. 1 Timothy 6.10 tells you, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and pierced themselves, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. God wants you to have money. God does not want money to have you. You see, exposing Satan's lies about the tithe, Satan, what he's done is he's confused us and he's seduced us into thinking that tithing is outdated. It's something only in the Old Testament. The law. The law. They say the law like it's a bad thing. Let me ask you a question to our biblical prognosticators. Where in the Bible did God abolish the law? Come on, come on. Let me tell you what Jesus made clear. This is his teaching about the law. Matthew 5, 17, 18. Now this is Jesus. In your home family Bible, it is in big, bold, red letters. Don't, under, don't misunderstand why I came. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, do not, not even the smallest details of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So when the demonic world or the misled or just the, the, those that are wrapped by the spirit of mammon tell you, that's Old Testament. Honey, we're not under the law no more. Look at the evidence. Look at the scripture, New Testament scripture spoken by Jesus himself. Matthew 5, 17. I came to accomplish their purpose. What is the purpose of the law and the writings of the prophet? To reveal God's character. To expose our sin. 
to direct us to Christ for salvation. Matthew 5.18, until heaven and earth disappear. Jesus has not abolished the law. It will only end when our current world system ends, as heaven and earth disappear. So you say, well, well when's that going to be? Well, Revelation 21.2 tells you. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. When will this earth and this heaven disappear? When you see the Jerusalem coming down. So can we ignore maybe just some of the Old Testament? Like, I would like to ignore the speeding laws of the state. So can we ignore some of the Old Testament? Well, let's see what Jesus has to say. Five, Matthew 5, 18. Not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear Amen. until its purpose is achieved. See, in the Hebrew, the smallest detail, he was talking about the writing of the law. Not even the smallest character. Maybe like they say, the comma to the top, the apostrophe. Not even that is abolished until the purposes are achieved. And what are those purposes? Again, to lead us into relationship with God and to point us to Jesus. You see, no wonder Satan wants you to ignore the Old Testament. The story of the Old Testament is the story of Jesus. You see, as a believer, let's be clear, as a believer, if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are not under the law's curse of condemnation. But you can't steal. You can't murder and rape. You can't lie and you can't commit adultery. You see, tithing is not a matter of Old Testament versus New Testament. It's not a matter of law versus grace. It's about relationship. It is about relationship. So let's look at another lie. God just wants your money. God just wants your money. You know, God owns everything. He doesn't need your money. Psalm 24, 1 tells you, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell within. You, this, it is God's. He doesn't need your money. He needs your heart. See, the truth is, God desires to give you wealth to show He's your provider. Deuteronomy 8.18 And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He. It is He. It is not your employer. It is not cryptocurrency. It is not the government. It is He who provides you power. Other translations say wisdom. It is He who gives you power to get wealth, that He may be established His covenant, which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Amen. God's not an ATM. Where's my mailbox money? God doesn't do that. God gives you wisdom and power. So you have the skill set. It's the old give a fish, teach the fish. And so for those who are saying, well, you know, the, 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 the never Old Testaments, testaments, let me go to the New Testament. Post-resurrection. And for those who lean on the Old Testament, I want you to think about this from 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to do what? Share for others. Amen. That is a New Testament promise. Does that sound like God just wants your money? Provision is a part of God's character. You see, He provided His only Son so you have everlasting life. Do you think He's going to withhold that which you need to thrive in this life? So some people say, well, I get it, but the Old Testament, that's just for Israel. That's just for We got nothing to do with those people. I mean, we got nothing. I know we're told to pray for them, but, but that's Israel. And that's what Satan wants you to believe. Until you go to 
the New Testament. And I will tell you, the, the Gospels, people will discard the word of Jesus Christ himself when he talks about the tithe and the law. And they say, well, you know, it, it, until he was crucified and resurrected, we're still officially under the law. And I dig it. I dig it. So here's from Romans. Here's from Paul. Post your argument. So the promise is received by faith. What promise is that? The promise of salvation. It is given as a free gift. By who? God, your provider. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. Those are the Jews, the Israelites. If we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the what? Is the father of all who believe. Is the father for all who believe. Through faith, you have become spiritual descendants of Abraham. As a spiritual descendant of Abraham, you are entitled to all the inheritance and the promises and the provisions given to Abraham. Church, I tell you, God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. And see, this isn't, we talk about karma and luck, and I ask you guys to stop saying that if you say it. Like, God does not bless us because we feel like we deserve to be blessed. Or because we beg Him for it. I know so many people that beg, 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 beg God to bless them. Let me tell you something. This is a kingdom. This is a governance. This is rules and structure and order. And it's a, it's a kingdom that operates based on the order and the structure and the authority. Amen. And if you want to unlock God's abundant blessings, you've got to start with one foundational principle. Amen. Obedience. Amen. Obedience. I will share with you from Malachi 3.10. Bless finances, start with obedience. That's it. That's it. Amen. Why I can't get ahead? I'm always broke as a joke. Are you starting with obedience? You see, Malachi 3.10 tells you, bring, remember the word bring, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. What is the storehouse? It is the local church. It is the place where spiritual bread is fed to the body of Christ. Amen. Amen. See, tithing goes back centuries before the law. I'll tell you a matter of fact, it goes back about 500 years before the law. Abraham at the time was still uh, Abram. He tithed, took Melchizedek. Melchizedek is an interesting character. Matter of fact, one night about a year ago, Terry, Terry and Laura Campbell called me about almost 11 o'clock. He's like, man, I hate to bother you. I'm like, oh my gosh, no way. I love hearing from you. What's up with Melchizedek? I'm like, are y'all seriously in your house at 11 o'clock at night studying Melchizedek? Yeah. I'm sorry to call you. No. This is a blessing. And we talked another hour about Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the priest of God most high, the forerunner to Jesus Christ. This is who Abraham tied to. Genesis 14, 18, 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of earth and heaven, heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemy into your hand. And he, Abram, gave who? Melchizedek. A what? A tenth of all. 500 years before the law. Guess what? As Max said, I just heard Max's voice when I said, guess what? 430 years before the law. Jacob, who became Israel, and is Abraham's grandson, guess what he did? He also tithed. Genesis 28, 20, 22. Then Jacob made a vow 
Remember the word vow, saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I can come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Amen. That's a tithe. The word tithe literally means tenth. You can't negotiate it. <laughs> it's a tenth. Now, let's go back to the word vow. You see, Jacob made a vow. What is a vow? It is a, it is a commitment to a continuation of an action. Like your wedding vows, did they end on the wedding day? No. They're not based on your emotions but on a lifelong commitment to honor your spouse, to honor God through those vows. Jacob made a vow to God, to an eternal God, an eternal vow. To do what? Tithe. You see, the principle of tithing is not timeless. Again, I challenge you, nowhere in Scripture does God tell you to stop bringing the tithe. Why would God end something that keeps our heart connected to Him and away from materialism? Why would He do that? Sounds like something Satan would do. So you say, this is another argument. Well, what about being a cheerful giver? Like giving 10% doesn't make me cheerful. I mean, I can read 2 Corinthians. I get to do what I want, Right? Man, this is beautiful. I'm glad you asked. If you like direct giving, and Lee and I love direct giving. We love to give to people. We love to give to organizations. That's your offering. That's your offering. You see, your offering goes above your tithe, not in place of your tithe. I'll give you an example. Lee and I have committed we always give at least 30% to the kingdom. Back when we were making money and then after we gave up all our money, and it doesn't matter. We have always committed to at least 30% of everything. Now, let me tell you, only 10% of that is our tithe. The 20% is our offering. Is our offering. 10% is to honor the command of God. The 20% is because we love to give. You see, Scripture shows you that you bring your tithe. Bring your tithe. You cannot give to God what God's already, what's already His. You see, if I give you my car keys, I expect you to bring my car back because it never was not mine. Now, you can give it a fresh wax, and that's your offering, but you cannot bring back to God. You cannot give to what's already His. So let's talk about the cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, uh, 6, 8. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he proposes in his heart, not begrudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God does love a cheerful giver. But I will tell you that this is a favorite scripture for people who claim God ended the tithe or that God allows them to give if they feel like it. I want to tell you that that's wrong. Do you love your spouse and do you love your family when you feel like it? Remember, this is not about money. This is about relationship. I want to, I want to share some facts with you about this scripture. I love this scripture. But you see, it says giving. Actually, the scripture says give. Cheer, cheerful giver, cheerful giver when you give. So let's not mistake that with tithing. That is giving. You see, if the scripture was talking about tithing, like tithe what you feel like. Tithe if you're happy. If it was about tithing, there would, no, there would be no variable between what is sowed and what is reaped. If it was about to tithe 10%, the scripture would read, He who sows 
10% reaps 10%. It doesn't say that. There is a variable. And if this, then that. If you reap, then you sow, then you reap. Because there's a variable equation to this scripture, and it's not give 10, get 10, reaping. No, there is a difference in the ratio of what you reap because it is based on what you sow. Tithing has no variable. It's always 10%. Why? Because the word literally means 10th. So why the first 10th? Excuse me. Because it takes faith. Faith in God. Not faith in mammon. If it feels hard, know that God honors your, your honesty. God honors your honesty. If you trust God, He will give you the courage to honor Him through His commands to tithe. So I want to give you a practical application. And it really does. This is why the elders, we were led to do the Sunday school. We know that it is so important to stick to the basic foundations of faith. It is so important to answer the questions of who, when, where, why. So I want to make this super practical to you. And if you're willing, this is just if you're if you're willing. So how do we know how much we're supposed to tithe? Well, that's a great question. So if you would, if you're willing, I would ask you to take out your phone and go to your calculator app. Or if you're a mathematician, you can figure it out in your head. So if you have your phone out and you have your calculator app, what I want you to, I want you to type in the amount that you get paid, whether it's daily or weekly or, or twice a month or whatever it is. It all adds up. But I want, you, I want to give you a practical example of what is the tithe. So you've got that amount on your, on your calculator. And then I want, you to, I want you to hit the X, the multiplication sign, which I do think that's a prophetic sign because what God wants to do is multiply your provisions through honoring Him in the tithe. So you put in your pay amount, you hit X, now type in point one zero. Now hit the equal sign. That amount on your screen is God's portion your tithe. There you go. Amen. The key to unlocking God's kingdom provision starts, starts with the amount on your screen. Now, what I will challenge you to do is to screenshot that calculator screen. Screenshot that amount. And I ask you to save it in your phone throughout the rest of this series. And I will say that if you're already tithing that amount, amen. Amen. What I will ask is that you pray about being more generous and more blessed through giving above the tithe. Giving directly. Giving to nonprofit organizations. What I will tell you, that if that amount causes you to struggle, (laughs) no. I just ask you, let it be an example of how far you are from having full faith in God to provide for you abundantly. I want you to pray about what's so much more important than that dollar amount on your calculator screen than it is in trusting God. And I ask that you pray that God frees you from the slavery and the bondage to that dollar amount on your screen. So that he can bring you into a season of freedom and abundant blessing. So much more than what your phone app shows. So Kurt, I I delayed and I apologize if if you make your way up or if you just want to sit and look at your calculator screen. (laughs) Oh, was worship not amazing today? These worship warriors are plowing ground to we can plant fertile seeds for blessings and God's provision. What I'll ask is we're going we're gonna to come into our time of tithes and offerings. What my prayer is, is, 
is like I said, this is not a money message. This is not about what the church needs. The Lord himself, the Lord asked me soon to be a month ago, are you willing to receive my word? I said, yes, Lord, yes. What are you willing to give? My time? I'll take that and? I said, myself? He said, I'll take it. The clarity of revelation, the seriousness of his word, the, the, the visions that he has given me. Well, I guess it'd be dreams because I'm an old man. Leah, Leah, let me know. Old men dream dreams. The dreams that the Lord is giving me for this church Amen. is a church, is a warrior culture, is a church of abundance, is a church of provision, is a church of, of loving one another with the heart of the Father. The dreams for this time that we're coming upon are perilous. We're moving into perilous, perilous times. The Lord is raising us up to equip godly leaders in ungodly times. The tithe is not about money to the church. The tithe is about honoring God's word so that he can raise you up. He is asking you like he is asking me, what are you willing to? to lay on the altar. He is willing, He is asking you to come into correction that He did not do away with the law. It will not go away until the end of these times till we see no Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So, I will ask this time that you will bring your tithes before the Lord. I will challenge you I will encourage you. I will pray that you step into faith. You step into boldness. That you stop being afraid to give what's the Lord's. That you will let that screen on the calculator app be a practical amount that the Lord has required from you. And to trust that in giving that amount, bringing that amount, bringing that amount, I'm sorry, in bringing that amount of the tithe before the Lord, that He will begin to bless you abundantly. And I'm going to ask, because the Holy Spirit just told me to ask. I will ask that you go above the tithe. See, an offering can be something specific, like the building fund, um, nonprofit organizations. The Holy Spirit is asking me to put before you a love offering for the Delos Santos family. What we'll do is, Scott, if this basket right here, if you'll designate this basket as a love offering for the Delos Santos family. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if we can stand together as the body, and, and I ask you as I'm going to pray us out, that, that, that if you will... Bring your tithes, and we say there's a lot of ways to do it, but I want you to pray a love offering for the Delos Santos family. So Lord, Father, we praise you, we praise you. Lord, thank you for, thank you for the heart of a father for this congregation. Thank you for, for a church that, that moves and true fear, reverence for your word, who loves you, loves your word, loves your commandment. Lord, we are so thankful that we are spiritual descendants of Father Abraham. I thank you that that we understand that we can go to Deuteronomy 28 and declare those blessings, but we don't, well, I don't want those curses. That we're so happy to grab Old Testament Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans you have for me. But we want to dismiss the other consequences. Thank you for the maturity of this body, Father God, to realize that your word is eternal. Hmm. So, Father, I do. I pray, I pray for the Delos Santos family. I pray a love offering for this family that they are able to, to go forward, to go forth with our blessing and our covering. That spiritual sonship doesn't end because geographical locations change. So, Father, I pray for the body. 
I pray that they receive this word as a word of encouragement and correction. I pray that you give them a sense of boldness because there is a change coming. Because there is a new season coming. Because there are perilous times coming. But like you provided your people in Egypt, a land of Goshen, we will be provided for if we only honor your word. So Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you for the body. We thank you for the encouragement and the correction from your scripture. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.